Welcome everyone. Good evening. It's great to have you here. My name is Claire Hassler-Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of the Robert Mondotti Institute for Wine and Food Science. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be here tonight with you for this very special event. The first 2017 Walt Cleans Lectureship on Wine Business. And some of you who have been to this before know that this is an endowed lectureship series on wine business that was named in honor of Walt Cleans, who's sitting in the front. And it was endowed by Behringer Glass Estates in honor of Walt's retirement in 2005. Has it been that long? Oh, I know. I know. And is now supported by Treasury Wine Estates. And, uh, the Robert Mondavi Institute has been privileged to host these events twice a year for the last several years, and uh, this is a very special night for me because the first time I met Augustin Huneus was at the home of Robert and Margaret Mondavi in Napa Valley in June 2005, the night before we broke ground for this beautiful complex. And uh, I asked Augustine if he would consider being on the honorary board for the Institute, and he agreed. And he served ever since, and has been to many of our events, uh, and has spoken before, uh, attended our uh, uh, grand opening of the winery a number of years ago, and the 2012 Mondavi Gala. And so we're thrilled to have him back tonight with his son, Augustine Francisco. And uh, they are going to deliver a lecture on um, innovation in the uh, world's second oldest profession. I didn't ask what that was, but I'm sure they will expound on that. And with no further ado, I'm going to have Walt Klenz, the man whose lectureship uh, this is named after, make the formal introductions. Thank you. And again, once again, thanks to you and your team for uh, for organizing this. It gets better, better and better as the years as the years go on. I think it's been eight or nine years now, at least since we've been doing it. Um, yeah, it is my my very uh, distinct pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, tonight's speakers. We have we have two a father and son team: Augustine Junius and Augustine Francisco Junius. Uh, I'll, start, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of dates and a lot of uh, wineries, uh, but uh, I've, I've got, I've got some seniors. Uh, wineries go back to his, his native Chile, where he worked in the, actually in the '60s in the wine in the, uh, the local wine business. Came to Cal came to the U.S. in the '70s and ran the Seagram's wine portfolio, which uh, uh, some of you who have been around a while remember was a very very strong, powerful portfolio of, uh, in that time. Uh, Paul Masson was a was a was a powerhouse in those days as part of that for that uh, project. And in '77, he uh, he he made his first uh, foray into California from a, from a, uh, a purchasing a winery in San Joaquin Valley. And I, I and I and I watched his progress. He had he had a long, a slow but steady uh, move to the north uh, from 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 Noble Vineyards, making a stop in the central uh, central coast with the winery, but ending ending up in the mid '80s. By becoming a partner in the Franciscan Winery right on uh, Highway 29 in Napa Valley, uh, and uh, and built and built that that property and 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 developed a portfolio with Estancia with Mount Vitor into a, into a wonderful wonderful property. At that time, uh, Augustine Francisco, after graduating college here, went back to Chile, like his father, worked in the wine business for several years, came back came back to California. Uh, got his MBA, I believe, here, and uh, worked at Hamburg and Quist with, uh, with Jean-Michel Vallet. Who's like that? First there. boss. Yeah, yeah exactly. first boss. <laughs> yes. And uh, actually, they were they were there when we did our IPO on Behringer in 1997. So uh, it's a small world. Uh, so in uh, in 19, I think it was uh, mid 90s, uh, uh, he joined the Franciscan uh, uh, business with his father, and uh, when it was stolen by the family, and ran. It they ran it together for several years, sold it to the Constellation Wine Group in, uh, I think, 1999. But, uh, but uh, Augustine uh, Jr. stayed on and, and ran that business for Constellation for four or five years, I believe, yeah. while his father was beginning to plot their next, uh, their next major uh, portfolio of luxury wineries. And, uh, uh, 
and started out with uh, Quintessa, uh, I, uh, the Quintessa Winery, the first of the property, which, which uh, some other people were trying to buy at the time, uh, uh, <laughs> but he got it. And it a beautiful, I don't even know, a beautiful property in the middle of Napa Valley. Um, but you guys would have turned it into a golf course. Yeah, well, I heard better use. <laughs> so, uh, those of, you, those of you who have not visited Quintessa, I absolutely recommend it. From an architectural point of view, the lines are fabulous. The, art, the architecture is spectacular. I don't know if you remember, Augustine. One day, uh, about the time you were starting to think about building a lot of property, you had the architectural plans. I, I, we met by accident in Napa. So it had to be like 19, late 90s, or early 2000. And you had this big bowl of plans under your arm. You, you pulled it out and showed me that, that incredible that incredible frontal piece that, 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 uh, that's on the, that you see as you go by in the Silverado Trail. And I knew you were going to have a spectacular uh, property at that time. At that time. Uh, so, uh, 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 Augustine Prince, uh, uh, Francisco rejoined uh, his father in about 2004, 2005, and they, uh, with the Quintessa Winery, and they bought the, they bought the Flowers Winery, a beautiful you know, lot property over in Sonoma. Uh, and, uh, of course, bought, bought and then resold the, the uh, Prisoner, uh, which is uh, Prisoner Wine Company, uh, several brands. So a a long and and uh, distinguished history of of, uh, of of building, buying, and 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 selling and selling wineries and and, 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 and building uh, wonderful wonderful luxury properties. Uh, and I and I I come to the conclusion I'm really going to talk about this. That the key element. From my point of view, is that that uh, that uh, Ineas is always we're, we're never looking back as to what from a consumer trend point of view. They were always a little ahead of most of us in, tr in trying to figure out what it was going to what the, where the consumer was going five, 10, 15 years down the road in terms of what products are going to run, what regions are gonna, they're going to be interested in, what price points they're they're uh, they're going to be moving toward. And I think, in my view, that's that's the secret of success. So please join me in welcoming uh, Augustine Senior and Augustine. Francisco Gimenez. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's amazing. She did that without notes. Huh? She did that without notes. Natasha now what? Well, you're great at names and numbers. My God, you know my, my, my numbers better than I do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claire and Walt, for that wonderful introduction. And um, it's a Tremendous honor to be here. I mean, one of the things that I wanted the first day I was here when it was just about to be finished was right here talking to you, talking to a group here. It's magnificent. Um, I'd like to start, and I have Claire's okay because this is for her and for Jean Michel as a repetition, with a tribute to the Institute, Davis University, and Bob Mondavi. And here it is. The Mondavi Institute is the one depository, the greatest depository of a great legacy. Robert Mondavi's legacy lies more in the reflection of this institute than any of his other works. During the period of Bob's activity, let's say from the late 60s to the early 90s, to the early 21st century actually, Wine took a monumental leap in the world, especially in the new world. Let me change glasses so I can uh, do a little better reading here, sorry. <clears throat> there was another partner here, and it was UC Davis. The great leap forward, we call it, in wine, one could call it, were influenced by these two forces which shared the same vision and interacted intensively and consciously took the leadership. Audacity, curiosity, and generosity were the defining traits. Both had the audacity to defy the dogma that wine quality was the sole domain of Europe. Both had the audacity to define wine as an essential part of an aesthetic way of life even in America. Both had the audacity to submit the sacred and aged traditions of wine to scientific scrutiny. As an entrepreneur, Bob was audacious, building a winery that even today, after almost half a century, remains an icon of forward thinking, incorporating 
the consumer to the technical and artistic creation with audacious, he was audacious also because he did with less resources than prudent a lot of things that most businesses wouldn't do. And they explored, as, as respectful and admiring as they were of their European colleagues, there was not one practice or premise that they did not test. Fermentation, yeast, aging, barrels, vine spacing, vineyard management, varietal, varietal adaptation. All aspects of viticulture were put to the trial, something quite novel in the world of wines and totally anathema in Europe. Both Bob and Margaret explored American cooking, greatly influencing a birth of interest in good food and its marriage to wine. His curiosity was unlimited, driving much of his activity, and he had the curiosity of a scientist. Davis was right there. Stainless steel fermenters, lower density plantings, new wine varieties, organolective research. It was a world <coughs> leader in viticulture and enology research with the freedom of mind that only exists in the United States. Their grand influence in our world of wine stems from their generosity. The very extensive experimentation done by Robert and his group was shared with all. More than that, it was highly publicized. He wanted to raise the tide, not just his vessel. This was new, almost shocking to a world of wine that played their cards very close to their chest and shared nothing. This trait, more than any other, defined Bob Mondavi, testimony of which is the Mondavi Institute. And also Davis. It spread its knowledge worldwide, welcoming foreign students generously to technical publications were very important. The, the, they were the Bible and the inspiration of winemakers all over the world. Robert's legacy, which contributes a beautiful and valuable part of our wine culture, is more properly to be maintained and upheld by this university <coughs> through the, this institute than through his other endeavors, which have grown to be important businesses and enterprise with little room for the freedom of the mind and from the economic consequences necessary to follow Bob's spirit. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> So now, um, you're going to hear something which is innovation in the second. You all know what the first is, profession. Or maybe, maybe, maybe we're the second. <laughs> maybe we're the first. I don't know. Can but I put the microphone on you? <laughs> but we're not going to talk about prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody leaves? OK. Um, it's very impressive for me to be here with my son. We worked together for a while, and I have now handed the business over to him. And I think that the value of this conversation is the value of a change in generation in an industry which is moving very, very fast. And um, what we're going to be talking about is the way I feel about certain important things and the way he feels. And <laughs> he runs the place now. He's defined my role in the company as father get the hell out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, and he's right. But before that, I wanted to, to, to <laughs> I wanted to substantiate a little bit uh, what Walt said about our history. I started in the wine business when I was about 24 years old, actually, in Chile. Not so much, no vocation. It just happened, you know, because I was in the fishing business, and all of a sudden I was invited to an investment which seemed attractive, and, and the fishing was good that year, so we put the fish into the wine, and it worked. The money. <laughs> the money, <laughs> yeah. The money. Turned the, the fish into money and money. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing about this is that I had been invited into this to liquidate the company. The company was Conchitoro, by the way. And we brought 25% stake in, in a group. 
And my job, I was never had seen a vine or run a winery or nothing. I was just fishing. And, and my job, because we couldn't get management to do it, was to liquidate the bulk wine inventories, which were enough to pay for the shares. I got in there, and after a few months of feeling the industry, and, and I fell in love with this, and I, I, I gave up fishing and decided I, this is going to be my life. And I convinced my partners that instead of liquidating and, and selling, we should keep it. This was a sort of a mediocre company in Chile, number five or 10 or whatever. And we turned it, I, I stayed there and ran it for 12 years, and it did magnificently well. We invented exporting wines to the United States, which, I mean, to, to, to the world, which today Chile, of course, lives from. And at that time, 5% of wine that we produced was bottled. Everything else was bulk. And it was uh, an era when, when you would just go with a big tank and fill up the, ta the, the, the bottles and the barrels that they had in different stores, and then they would fill it. was totally very, very different. It grew. It did marvelously well. And then we elected a Marxist president who decided that he wanted the state to run my company. So <clears throat> in... in um, 12 years after I took it over, I had an, what they call an interventor. An interventor is a way of taking over your company without paying you for it. Expropriation would have required payment according to the Chilean constitution. And intervention is something that most countries have as a resource for um, businesses that are of high social importance. And wine in Chile was declared of high social importance. And we were the first, so we were taken over by the government. And we sort of had to leave and pretty quick. And we went to Argentina. And there, I started working for Seagram. The reason why I started working for Seagram is because I had been negotiating with them distribution in some countries. And they told me that if I wanted them to distribute my wines in America, I would have to sell them a part of the company. So I said, OK. And they were negotiating with me. They were doing due diligence to buy part of the company at that time. And then, of course, the election was a big surprise. And by the way, the election in Chile would not have had the effects it had. We would not have had a Marxist government it had, it, if it had not been for Mr. Henry Kissinger and the CIA. They fouled it to a point where we had to give the presidency to Salvador Allende. And that's a political issue that sometimes I get in trouble for saying, maybe particularly today, maybe. Um, anyway, we left Chile and we went to Argentina where I worked for Seagram. And then they invited me. The Seagram was also a little bit of, uh, I mean, Argentina was a little bit of a disaster. There was a dirty war going on. And, and, uh, and they were, their big sort of tool was kidnapping executives uh, particularly American executives, and that's the way they financed the revolution. And my colleague of Hiram Walker was kidnapped and killed, and by that time we said, we got to get out of here. And um, I was invited to come to New York as the first international vice president of CERN. Uh, after a few uh, months, uh, we conv I convinced uh, Edgar Bronfman, who was the owner, instead of dividing the company, international, national, divided wine and spirits because it was all together then and the distribution was very complicated. So then they invited me to New York where I ran the wine business. I was president of Paul Masson and I was running 14 other wineries in, in about 12 countries. And so quite little of my son here, but where were you now? Tell, tell them where you were all this time. Uh. <laughs> I was still in grammar school. <laughs> no, keep going. Finish up. What do you mean finish up? The career. No, you're in oh, the career. career. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, as soon as I got my green card, which is four years after I was in New York, uh, I decided, you know, I'm not really a good corporate kind of. I'm not really um, <clears throat> terribly comfortable as a corporate executive. I was too much of my own entrepreneur. 
So I decided to come to California where wine was, right? And uh, <clears throat> there I bought a property which had been offered to Palma Son and we decided not to buy it there. <coughs> it was called Noble Vineyards, big vineyard in the Central Valley, producing an enormous amount of, of wine per acre, like we were, I think a bad year would have been 20 tons per acre. And we had a big winery, and it was the time when American wine was mostly Chablis and Burgundy. And we made a pretty good Chablis, so that's what started me connecting with Napa Valley. We Does that? I can hold it. So we made a very good Chablis, and we started selling it to everybody in Napa, by the way, we wanted to sell beautiful, fantastic wines, but the wines people were buying were Chablis or, or, or Burgundy. And we made a very good Chablis at a very good price. We sold it to most Napa wineries, and that's how I got my sort of inkling of what Napa was, and I said, I got to get there. And uh, so eventually from, from Noble Vineyards in, in Kerman, California, uh, I was able to buy Concanon. Concanon sort of grew out of my hands, and I was invited to participate after as a partner in Franciscan. And Franciscan grew very beautifully, and we we created Estancia, Mount Vitor, and a few other things. And that's where Augustine joined me again. And I think I better leave it there, wouldn't you? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it. So I had a very different upbringing. I, I always tell people that I kind of grew up in the fine wine business. And because really my consciousness really starts when my father was at Seagram's. And so he would drag me along on these business trips. And I'd stay at Ricasoli, for example, when my dad would go out to dinner with the Baron or, or we'd go to Lafitte. And this is me and my sister as little kids, right, which we wanted n none of this. Or we'd go on vacation to Burgundy as little kids. And, um, you know, so, so I kind of grew up in, in, in this context of the wine business and frankly not very interested in it. You know, it wasn't um, kind of a very sexy business back then. It was just a business like anything else. Nobody really cared about it. I always compare it to like, um, you know, when, I don't know, when you grow up and, and your sister, right? And then all of a sudden when you get older, your friends start telling you your sister's cute. And like for the first time you notice that other people. That, that's how I became attracted to the wine business because when I was growing up and in college, my friends would say, oh my God, your family's in the wine business? That's so cool. I'd be like, like really? That's cool? <laughs> uh, and so uh, I went to Berkeley. Uh, you know, after college, I couldn't get a job anywhere. So my father was starting a wine business in Chile. And you know, the, the job description was that you had to know a little bit about wine, which I did, and you had to speak English, which I did, and so I got a job in Chile. Um, and, um, but really, I couldn't kind of wait to get back um, and out of the wine business, frankly, and so I went to uh, business school. I came back to the U.S. to work at Estancia for a little bit. Then I went to business school and convinced Jean-Michel to hire me at Hamburg & Quist as uh, an investment banker. And the truth is I love the work. And I remember kind of getting up in the morning and putting on my fancy suit. And I really loved the work. But then what happened was that there was, um, you know, my father lost his head of sales at Franciscan. And he called me and said, hey, if you ever wanted to join the business, now is the time. I've got an opportunity. And, you know, I, I wasn't that kind of convinced. But I remember that, you know, Bill Hamburg kind of sat me down and said, hey, you know, this is a pretty unique opportunity to work with your father, and if you don't do it, you might regret it. And if it doesn't work out, you can have your job back. And so that's when I went and uh, took over sales for Franciscan. And it was kind of a bumpy ride. I was just out of business school, so I kind of thought I knew it all, and I was calling on these distributors and telling them how shitty they were and that they didn't know what they were doing. And, Right, all, all of that stuff that you get in the beginning years, and um, but it was a really fun time in the wine business. You know, I'm 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 talking about like 1995 to 2000, and if you guys remember, that's when Estancia was turning into this big brand, and Kendall Jackson was ruling the world, and Mandavi was coming out with all these new projects. 
Uh, Behringer was doing lots of fun things with Meridian and all of the things. It was the Merlot craze. We all couldn't make enough Merlot and coming out with Merlots. I remember the fights coming with my father coming out with an Estancia Merlot. Um, and, and it was just kind of a really fun time. And then um, we grew a lot in that time. We were very successful together. Uh, you know, my father was really great at, you know, he always had, I think one of the things that made us a good team always was that we had very different focuses in the wine business. I was always very marketing and sales, and he was always very production. I mean, very involved in marketing and sales too, but more at the theoretical level. And I was very kind of tactical. And so that, that really worked out well. And we always had kind of different perspectives, which is what we're going to try to showcase today in this talk. Um, and then during the process of Constellation, you know, I was probably 31, 32 years old. And you know, Richard Sands and us worked really closely during the sale. And you know, Richard kind of decided to make me CEO of his fine wine business, which I actually thought was insane at the time. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, you don't want me running your business. And he said, no, no, we'll, we'll help you along. And, and you know, we had in the portfolio, it became kind of the fine wine division of Constellation. And we had in the portfolio, uh, you know, Franciscan, Estancia, Mount Vitor, but they also had acquired Simi previous to that, which wasn't doing very well. So they folded Simi back into my portfolio. And it was easy, right? Because all I did was take everything back that they had done for the last five years, and Simi just took off. And, uh, and then in 2001, was it, Joel? We were able to acquire Ravenswood, which was one of my favorite, like, you know, projects, brands um, in the wine business. And we built kind of what, what we thought was the luxury wine business back then at $20 retail. You know, we built a great business and we built a great company. And um, I remember that, um, you know, like my dad, one of the things I inherited from my father was the bug to be an entrepreneur. So after like three or four years, right, even though I was doing all this stuff, right, that I never imagined I would get to do and, and kind of doing very well economically and all that stuff, I kind of decided that, that I had to go out and do something different or go back to, to the family business. So um, in 2004, your dates were dead on, um, and, you know, the company was having a great year, and I flew back to New York to resign and, and um, you know, start again. And that's when you know, when, when kind of Huneus Vintners really starts again. And, and back then, it was a tiny little business. We had Quintessa, which was making about 5,000 cases of wine back then. Um, and we had just taken back the distribution of our Chilean wines from Constellation. So it was, you know, that, that was more volume, but very low price. So it was kind of this tiny little business. And, um, you know, we, we started to grow again. And uh, we grew, you know, we started a project called Faust, which you tasted out there, um, you know, which became very successful. Um, you know, one of the things that my dad, um, you know, left me with in, in, the, in the transition was a company with a brilliant balance sheet. And that proved really valuable in 08 and 09 because, you know, the financial system kind of froze up. And the reason we were able to acquire flowers in 2008 was because we could, and not many other people could, right? And, and I had the balance sheet to be able to buy in 2009 to take a gamble on this brand that we had been looking at in the market, and it was the prisoner, and we saw how it was so cool. And for us, of course, it was totally weird, right? Because I grew up in the fine wine business, so the notion of an expensive wine that didn't have a winery and didn't own any vineyards, and it was a blend of Zinfandel and Cabernet, just seemed like the nuttiest thing ever. But in the end, after heated, heated discussions with our board and, <laughs> and my dad, you know, but, but it's true, you know, it's funny because he was against it, but, you know, it was my company and I was running it and he let me do it. And, um, you know, and, uh, and we built a great company. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you kind of proudly that last year, you know, we, we really focused on kind of the $50 price point. We thought that was the right place to be. And last year, you know, before we sold The Prisoner, we sold uh, almost 300,000 cases of wine uh, at $50 retail, which probably made us one of the largest fine wine companies in the world. And we did it very under the radar. We did it with, you know, very few products. You know, we had five SKUs. Um, and, and we built a really successful company. Um, so that was it. That's my 
intro. Uh, we always talk about the wine industry, and there is a big, big, big difference between what I would call common or commercial wines or commodity wines and fine wines. And they react totally different economically. The marketing is completely different. The, the point of sale, the, the, even the, the consumption habits are different. And what we're going to talk about today is the fine wine business, which I would say $15 and higher, right? Oh, per, I'd go higher. $20. $40. OK, well, if you go to 40 you're talking about 7% of the business yeah, or less. But that's the fine wine business. I so think. we're talking about very, very small segment of the business, which is probably the segment that, that you know. And it's certainly a segment to which Davis dedicates a lot of their efforts. And, and it sort of leads the other, but is a completely different reaction. And, and frankly, um, I have been involved in, in commercial wines, let's call it. Conchitoro was definitely a big company, and, and, and so was Paul Masson. Uh, but I have to say that I didn't uh, sort of like it compared to, I, I think that the ultimate goal is to produce one bottle and sell it at $10 million a year, and that would be the perfect winery for me. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about the fine wine industry. Yep. The fine wine activity. And I'll say that, that um, you know, I, th I think it's a really relevant time right now for the fine wine business because I would say to you that as, as um, somebody who's now been in this fine wine business for 30 years, all of the time that we were in the fine wine business, it was always kind of a sideshow in our industry. The big brands were Estancia and Kendall Jackson and Mondavi and Behringer, and that's where everybody kind of wanted to be. And sure, the distributors love to talk about you know, Cuvée Sauvage or Quintessa or some of the wines, but the business was the other stuff. And today we're at a time where that has all changed. Today it's all about fine wine, which is proven by Constellation's acquisition of the prisoner or Gallo going out and buying a brand for the first time in the company's history or in Swift. Or the other day I had breakfast with this guy who runs a private equity fund who owns Planet Granite and Vita Water, and they just spent $800 million to buy Duckhorn and get into the wine business. And by the way, they're not like us. They actually have a choice. You know, we're screwed. All we know how to do is the wine business. <laughs> but they actually opted to get into this business. And I think it's a really exciting time for the fine wine business because, you know, if one of you guys wanted to go out and build an Estancia, right? The tactics, the, the way to do it, is totally proven and established, right? You, you, know, you make wine, you go to a big distributor, you get up promotions, you do incentives, you do quantity discounts, you do buy the glass pricing, you advertise, you do coupons. That's the way you build a brand. It doesn't always work, but those are the tactics. If you want to go out and build the next Silver Oak, you know, nobody's ever done that. How do you do it? How do you make a wine scarce and be everywhere at the same time? How do you think about marketing, about distribution? It's totally different, you know? We always focus about how many accounts we're in, and that's a lingo that really belongs to big scale. Because when you're trying to sell flower Chardonnay for $120 on a wine list, there's very few accounts that actually know how to sell it. And so you have to think about distribution in a totally different way. So, it is an exciting time. I, I kind of feel like it's the dawn of the fine wine business. And the stuff that's going to happen in the next 10 years, I think, is going to make our head spin. So it's an appropriate time to talk about the fine wine business. <laughs> the way I'm proposing to my son that we <coughs> take this discussion is that I'm going to sort of relate the, the things that I've learned in the, in, the, in the business and define my resolution of those issues. And I'm going to ask Augustine to say to you the way he sees it in, in the new sort of scenario that you're living with. And I, I call them my dogmas. My dogma, number one, is something that, that, that you mentioned, Walt, which is in our business, you have to have your feet firmly on the ground, but your nose has to be seeking the aromas that are coming. The wine business is very slow in reacting. If you want to change something, you have to start by changing the varietal in the vineyard, perhaps even changing the vineyard. And that's five years down the road, you might get a, another new wine. 
So you have to really be very conscious of what's coming. You can't just decide, okay, tomorrow we're going to go Merlot, for example. Okay? No, it, with, when the Merlot craze came, everybody was scrounging to plant Merlot, but the, you start by not having enough plants to go around. So now the nurseries have to get in the, I mean, anyway, to make it short, whatever is today will not be tomorrow. So the question is firmly on the ground, but what do you see is coming, and that's what's going to make you successful or not. I agree with that one. We're, we're <laughs> aligned there. <laughs> is that all we get? No, that's all we get. We're aligned. No, I think that that's right. I mean, I think that, I think that what we've seen happen is that you know the the wine business has really changed, and you've seen it in you know what 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 I think is great. I, I remember when we did a trip, all of us to Burgundy, and it was great and it was a lot of fun. But I remember saying to my dad, Jean Michel holy shit, if I was born in Burgundy, like either you're born to a family with Grand Cru vineyards or you're screwed. There's no in between, right? There's, you will never make a Grand Cru if you're not. So there's no chance for entrepreneurs or people that are starting. And, and I think what's great about the California wine business is that it changes and that there's diverse. When I was a kid, the hot brands, well, when I was you know, uh, at Franciscan running sales, the, hot, the hottest brand was uh, Claude de Bois Merlot. In every hot restaurant you went, there was Claude de Bois Merlot. Now try and find Claude de Bois Merlot in a restaurant, right? <laughs> and, and it just, I, I, that's what I love about this business, is that it changes and there's an opportunity for, you know, the new entrepreneurs. Dogma number two. My dogma number two. Our fine wine business will not react like a typical packaged consumer goods. And I always like to say, uh, the first time I said it was in one of Jean-Michel's uh, seminars, is our business is littered with the cadavers of the most distinguished marketers in the world, like Coca-Cola, like Pepsi-Cola, like Pillsbury. They all come in and tell all our, all our silly farmers how to market wines. So they start trying to do what they did in, in selling their other consumer goods, and they fail miserably. Wine does not conform to it. Why? Because it requires loyalty, it requires economies of scale, it, it requires um, all of these things which in wine does not happen. Okay, this one I do have kind of an issue with, which is, I mean, I, I think that that's right. I, I think that in the end, you know, wine has a different type of uh, context than a lot of consumer brands, right? And, you know, one of the things that always, you know, bugs me is in our business, you know, on-premise restaurants are always very concerned about what the retail price is of your wine. And I always say, well, why don't you care about Coca-Cola? You know, because when you go into a restaurant, it's $5 for a Coke. When you go into a supermarket, it's $5 for a six-pack. And somehow, you know, we get, you know, burdened with this. There's this other issue which happens in our industry, which is to really be a great fine wine company, you have to feel small. Like, you can be big, you know, but you have to feel small. And that's not necessarily the case for many consumer branded companies. On the other hand, I think it is a really complex category for consumers that are coming into the wine business. And there's a lot of people coming into the wine business, right? I mean, what's happening right now is, you know, food, you know, what, 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 uh, I'm going to say it a different way, which is what, what, what makes the fine wine business different is you sell liquid, but you sell a lot more than liquid, right? You sell prestige, you sell stories, you sell heritage. And those things are really hard to communicate in a traditional kind of consumer product way. But on the other hand, what's happening with the plethora of wines and things that are coming in is that it increases the importance of brands in the sense that consumers are confronted with 500 Chardonnays and they have to pick one to pick for dinner. And they go to the guy and say, well, I need a Chardonnay. And he says, well, you know, do you want it from France or Germany or Chile or whatever? And you say, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, you know, just give me a good Chardonnay. And so I think brands, you know, play a value in that. And, and to me, the evidence in that is in that brands, you know, do distinguish. You know, we were having a big debate about what 
constitutes a brand in the wine business. And to me, it's very simple, which is if you're able to sell your liquid for way more expensive than everybody else, that's a brand, right? <laughs> and, and that happens. You know, Lafitte sells for much more than its neighbor. DRC sells for much more than its neighbor. And, and that is the value of brands. They are brands that trade in a different characteristics, you know, prestige and heritage, and those things are very instrumental in defining those brands. But ultimately, there is brand value in the wine business. And my bet is that that will actually become more prevalent in the future, not less prevalent. OK. I'm going to go back a little, a little bit to say um, I agree with everything Augusta and Francisco have said. Mm -hmm. But when I, I would define a brand as something that can grow indefinitely. and. Our fine wine business is to a great degree anchored on properties. All of Europe is anchored on properties rather than brands. And properties can't grow. Or they can, it's very little. Or, or, or they can, it's also very defined where. And in the high end of our business, I don't see that brands can subsist because brand loyalty is impossible. If somebody goes to a restaurant, and he orders Quintessa, and Quintessa is not there. Now, if it's any other packaged consumer goods, if it's cigarettes, or if it's perfume, or if it's uh, even champagne, by the way, or whiskey, you would probably walk out and go to the next door. But if you go to a restaurant and you ask for Quintessa, and it's not there, it's because it's one of us, too, that's there. Now, nobody else, <laughs> nobody nobody else, nobody else will walk out of a restaurant. They just go and find that category. So what we sell is really categories. A little bit, and I know you don't agree with this, is like cheese. You all love certain types of cheese, and you most likely don't have the foggiest idea of what the brand is of that cheese. You know you like camembert, or you like blue cheese, or you like this or that, but those are categories, they're not brands. Wine, the finer wine business, to a certain extent, the, the, the Grand Cru of Bordeaux, or, or, or the Burgundies, and uh, even the Napa blends, they are categories, and they're pretty, interchangeable, I think, in the minds of the high-end consumer. And the other? I'll, I'll stop. I, I think the way you always explained this to me, which I thought as a kid and I still remember, is you would say, look, you can't escape your category. So even the most successful brand in the world, like back in the day of Blue Nun, you've heard, all heard of Blue Nun? When Riesling died, so too did Blue Nun, even though it was the most successful yes. brand in the Riesling category. That was lesson number right? one. But within a category, there can be a brand, I think. There, there can be brand value, and, and certain brands just do better than, than others. But I think it is absolutely true, which is a brand kind of can't escape its category. No matter how good your brand is, if you're not in a good category, you're doomed. And even a bad brand in a great category will do better than a good brand in a bad category. And so the notion of category is very important, and I think it kind of sets the stage. Just in Requiem, Paul Masson, Almaden, Rio Nite, uh, um, Mateus. This is a cemetery of brands. These are big, beautiful brands that were wonderful. Today, Requiem and Pachi. OK, dogma number three. This has to do with the culture, US culture. But a very important part of US culture is Terroir versus varietal. In the new world, we define wines or denominate them according to their varietal content. In the old world, they define them according to their appellation, or more importantly, in the higher ends, their terroir. And uh, I think, I, I believe very much in one maxim, which is in vino veritas. In the long term, what is true will prevail, and what is true is that the varietal does not define at all what you're going to get in that bottle. It is defined only if you know where it comes from. Uh, I mean, listen, I, I think that's true. Um, I think you have to put that in the context of what's happened in the wine business over the last 20 years, which is the effect of Robert Parker and the Wine Spectator that have rated wines a certain way. And it just turns out they had very similar taste, right? So everybody ran to those flavors. You also have a real homo 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 
homogene homogeneity or something, something like that, of, of what's been planted, right? So if you look at Pinot Noir 20 years ago or 30 years ago in California, there were hundreds of clones, Swan clones and uh, Jensen clones and Davis clones, and they were all over, and you know, there was a big controversy because there were even Gamay clones that were Pinot Noir, and, and, and now what has happened uh, with the boom of Pinot Noir is that everybody has planted Dijon clones. Dijon clones in, D in Burgundy, Dijon clones in Chile, Dijon clones in California, Dijon clones, and that too has brought styles and taste together. In that context, you know, it, it is also true that wine quality has improved, right? And so, you know, in the old days, you would taste 20 Napa cabs, and five of them were corked, and three of them were oxidized, and you were left with 10 wines that were well made that were, you could actually compare in your tasting. Today, they're all well made. And, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it's, while it is true that nobody can taste the difference between a Napa Merlot and a Napa Cabernet, okay? I could line up glasses for them, and I've done this with Master Sommeliers, and nobody can tell the difference. It is also true that, you know, a uh, mountain Napa Cap Merlot can be more tannic than a valley floor Napa Cabernet. That, that is absolutely true. But think of the consumer, right? With all the appellations that are starting to make wine, I, I just don't see it as a feasible way to market wines with appellations because you know nobody's going to know what a Casablanca white wine tastes like. Nobody's going to know what a Lebanese red wine is going to taste like. You know, and so that's something that 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 worked, I think, for Burgundy and Bordeaux because they were the first movers. But I think in the future we have to have different cues to bring our consumers. Um, you know, to get them excited about wine and allow them to pick what they're going to pick off of a shelf. And, and imagine a world where every different region had just its region name. How confusing that would be. How do you get new people into the category? It's hard enough as it is. Voilà la différence. <laughs> My dogma number four the influence of ratings. This was an American invention, ratings. And the Europeans at first just scoffed at it and laughed. How can these silly Americans try to rate wines, all wines, in a numerical number? And they're all, you know, every wine can be placed in a certain level. It is a completely different concept of quality than what they had, which is basically that wine has to be typical not has to conform to somebody's high uh, ideal of what a wine should taste like theoretically, which is the rater. They have some absolute wisdom of what the top quality is. And, and every wine in the world that you give them, they have this incredible gift of God to know which is the best. In Europe, it wasn't like that at all. The best wine was the one that conformed to a certain type, the Bordeaux or whatever. And I think that for, for the American public that was just entering the wine business and there's so much wine, it helped. People are very comfortable. This wine is 93, it's gotta be good, you know? Better than this one, which is 85. Well, that wasn't true, by the way, because when you think of a rating, you immediately think, well, this rates more or less the pleasure I'm going to get out of that wine. But it isn't. It's the pleasure that somebody else got out of that wine. Somebody that, that, that has a completely different palate from yours, whose, whose wife is somebody that I wouldn't get married to, you know? And it, I mean, totally different. So why should they be able to choose the wine that I'm going to like? Anyway, so that is going wrong. I think that that is going out. It, it, it had its good things. Right. But it had one big problem. It created the need to produce wines pretty similar. Every winemaker was sort of requested to get good ratings. Sorry, go ahead. No. Um, so I, I think the notion that ratings are going away is, is absolutely true. I, I can tell you that as a wine sales guy. You know, in the old days when you got a 90 on your Estancia Chardonnay or your Meridian, your wine flew, like it came out of the shelves. Today, there's so many 90s from so many different raters from all over the place that I'll, uh, the, the impact is less. 
over the long term, having a consistent record of high scores is something that still adds value. But I would say something. I would say the European system of quality was different. It was, I'm Lafitte. 300 years ago, they said I was the best. So you like it or you're wrong. That was yes. their system. Yes, absolutely. And yes. they had no incentive to make wine better, right? They was just like, you know, I'm DRC. It doesn't matter if it's oxidized. If, if it's like a, you know, a fancy French restaurant. Um, and so I think that in the end, you know, it, 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 it brought a discipline to even the most famous producers. And, and, and it certainly changed styles, but I think it improved the discipline of, of quality. But it is absolutely true that I think that the, 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 the generation that becomes wine drinkers kind of after, you know, the 30-year-olds, the millennials, and they're not going to care what Robert Parker says. And, you know, when with wines like The Prisoner, I remember one of the first things, um, you know, it always got great ratings, The Prisoner. And, you know, we'd show it off because we were so accustomed to that being such a relevant thing. And people didn't care at all that we got this rating or that rating. It was all about their connection to the brand and, or the wine, if not a brand, and, and how they came to it. And so, you know, that's going to change. And I think, you know, a lot of the, the social interaction, you know, social media, account, things like, um, you know, delectable and drink are going to change so that people are recommending wines to people, not uh, kings and queens right, recommending wine to the masses, which is kind of the way it is now. And so I think that is absolutely going to change. Dogma number five to me, there's a big tendency now, a trend of direct-to-consumer in, in our Napa wineries particularly, but in a lot of other places. Direct-to-consumer is trending, trending, trending. And I always defend general distribution. Because I tell Augustine, Francisco, that <clears throat> the real temple of fine wine is the restaurant. That's where wine is served with its ceremony, with its parsimony, it's served with the right food. And, and that is really, to be in the wine list is the Oscar of the wine business. To, be, to sell directly, you sell to a group of people and you sell all you want, I mean all you can but you're not getting the prestige required to form part of that upper echelon. And um, well. So uh, here is a, is a point where, where um, I, I, I do disagree. I, I think ultimately, you know, what, what we recognize very strongly in, in our company is that we don't, I mean, we do sell wine and we care a lot about the quality, but we sell a lot more than that. We sell a lifestyle, we sell an experience. And you know, what, what, what plays in our favor is, of course, the trends that are coming into the marketplace now with lots of you know, restaurants, right? So today, getting a reservation at a restaurant, at a hot restaurant in town on Friday night at 8.30 is way more like tickets to Hamilton than it is about food. It's about entertainment. And all of the chefs, which was started a lot by Thomas Keller, created this culture of telling people where the food comes from and you know your butter was made by this cow which came from Vermont and <laughs> the butter is named you know Jane's farm butter and that's what we do that's what we do better than anybody else that is the wine business and so you know to offer people that lifestyle experience you know it, it is it is it is what people come to Napa Valley for they don't come to actually buy a bottle of wine they can do that in a store they come to get a glimpse behind the curtain of what our lifestyle is like what our reputation is like our heritage and and I'll say to you you know Quintessa wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't for you know the 20,000 people that come and visit us every year and go home and fight for it in their restaurants and and in their stores um, I don't I agree with my father that that having presence in the wholesale market having I do believe that brands are built in the on-premise so having great on-premise distribution is one of the one of the strongest and most powerful ways to build brands um, so I think that's very important but I do think that the DTC is not going away I think it's part of what people aspire to in the high-end wine business we have to go fairly f I know can we go a little further? Okay. Dogma number six. Let's do two more. And this is the, what? Let's do two more. No, 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 I have a ten here. <laughs> 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 Gotta go through every one. <laughs> Cliche number one. 
wine is a people business, the worst cliche you can do. But it's so true. And, 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 and I think that in the fine wine business, people, as you've said in, 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 in very of the th many of the arguments you've given, people look for more than just a brand. They look for the person behind the brand. They look to see who's there. What is it? What? And that's the way we sell. We never use media advertising in the fine wine business. You won't see us there. You will see us talking to the distributor, the restaurateur, to you. You'll see us portraying our personality. It is that which really promotes wine in the, in the, in the high-end business. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's definitely a people business. And, and, you know, one of the great privileges I've had, I think, in the business is, you know, following in your footsteps because you, you know, I came in and you kind of paved the road and, and kind of laid out such a great reputation that I could take advantage of. Um, but, but I think that, that, that it's different. I think when brands really become successful, they transcend their owner, their story, their, their everything that makes them, you know, the, the brands start in a, finish in a different way than they start. So, you know, it is a people business until you really become successful. And when you really become successful, it starts to become, a, you know, not so much a people business because, you know, your distribution is so broad that you can't touch everybody anymore. Or you're in bigger distributors that have so many salespeople. You know, for us, you know, we're distributed a lot by Southern. You know, Southern has a thousand salespeople just in California. I can't even write a letter to those thousand salespeople every year. So, so I think that there is, you know, a component of that, but I think that the brands that really hit stride, the, the, the companies that resonate with the consumers in a way like the Prisoner did, or like Silver Oak does, or like Rombauer does, you know, or th those brands kind of transcend that. I mean, to really be successful, you kind of outgrow that uh, cliche. And it is a cliche. <laughs> You guys are going to vote for who's right. Isn't it? <laughs> Dogma number seven is that the wine business came to us, the wine culture came to us, wrapped in European traditions. As, they, as we infiltrate that tradition with American culture, the changes are going to be phenomenal. And I would say that the changes are going to happen very soon and very dramatically, and they will have to do with, with um, for example, packaging. Silly bottle that we use, the whole paraphernalia, it doesn't fit exactly in the refrigerator, it's not exactly good for one dinner or two. I mean, packaging is going to change dramatically, and a lot of other things are going to change, and. Um, I think that brands, ratings, packaging, varietals are going to change. That's where my nose is. Yeah, I think I think those things are right, and I think you know, I, I you know, the the prisoner was kind of a great example of that because it was one of the first wines to really try to be high quality and have a little bit of sweetness. And of course, you know, if you tasted this with any European winemaker, they would have just said, "Oh my God, this is just horrible." And I think this is a really important point, which is um, that one of the things that I think uh, the, you know the American wine business has done and continues to do very well is they separate out like what consumers really want and what the critics tell you you want. And there's a difference between the two, right? And, and when you're a wine geek and you're totally in it, there's certain things that you like and you love them. And, and you know, when consumers are getting into the industry, they have a different palate. They're looking for, you know, different things. You know, wine is an acquired taste. You know, it's, it's a little bit like coffee. You know, I have a lot of kids. And I remember when, you know, when your older one starts drinking coffee, at first they put tons and tons of sugar in it, right, to get it sweet. And then after a while, they start to like black coffee or milk chocolate. You know, you start with milk chocolate, and then after a while, you start to like dark chocolate. That's an evolution that, that I think, you know, consumers have to make in their way. And what I think the industry in the U.S. has been really good about is figuring stuff out that, that gets the consumers there. Think about how big, you know, one of the biggest categories right now in the U.S. is the red blend category. That totally didn't exist five years ago. It's crazy. And it's bringing tons of new people into the industry. 
And you know, I love what, um, what, what your son is doing, Joel, in sparkling wine. You know, sparkling wine, it, you know, most of the sparkling wine that's made in California either comes from a French house or looks like it comes from a French house. And they're all trying to be like French, but at a lower price point. Somebody's going to come and figure out how to make this totally different and fun and in different ways where quality is not measured either by how old you are or whether it's dry or sweet, right? And, and somebody's going to figure it out. And I don't know what that is. And I think my dad's right. It's going to be in packaging. Like somebody's going to make a light up bottle with champagne. <laughs> or, you know, what, what, what Joel's son is doing is, you know, with Under the Wire, they're going with very high end regarded vineyards and making vineyard designates of sparkling wines. To me, there's no question in my mind, especially with Trump's 20% import tax, that, that there's going to be, you know, California sparkling wines, you know, 10, 20 years from now are going to be the equivalent of Napa Cab compared to Bordeaux, right? That's going to change. That hasn't happened yet. You know, when you look at high-end white wine, you know, there's no, today, the high end is totally a red wine market in the U.S., right? That's going to change. You know, and, you know that's like fat ties, skinny ties. It, it changes around. And today, we're a very red wine culture. Trust me, there's going to be high end white wines. There's going to be a Dagano of Sauvignon Blanc in California. There is going to be you know, high end Chardonnays that are four or $500 <coughs> a bottle. You know, that is something that's coming. Dogma number eight for me is the tremendous importance of family, of the wine business being led by family businesses. And there's a role for corporate businesses, to all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you, can, you can tell me I'm wrong in a lot of this, but the vocation of innovation, of experimentation, of, 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 of opening up new things is really a family affair more than a corporate affair. I don't know that corporate executives have the entitlement to go out and risk profits or risk investments like a private owner would and has done. So my point is that it is very important to, to, that the wine business continue being, to a great extent, this particular end of the wine business, to a great extent led by Vintners with the vocation for innovation and novelty. And um, can I go now? Yeah. OK. So um, yeah, it's funny that family is such an important part of the wine business and selling. People say it, family owned, as if it was a good thing. Once you've been in a family business, you know what that really means is emotional decision making, <laughs> dysfunctional. Everybody has a different opinion. So you kind of want to say, look, I want a nice corporate wine where people are making good decisions. I also think that there's, you know, I mean, we're very lucky. We've had kind of one of the few transitions, really good transitions in the wine business. But I grew up in the wine business. I saw all the, you know, disasters that were family transitions in Napa, in Italy, in Bordeaux. You know, it's, it's very tough to actually do that well. And, and I think the, 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 I don't know, the opening for success in a good family transition is, is, is very hard. Um, there's, you know, th there's something very important about being a family wine business, and I think that those things are, are, are something that's going to continue. But there's certainly a role for all the professional managers that are coming into this business. I think you know, it, is, it is really, the landscape is changing. You know, with schools like Davis and, and, and others that are training professionals, and, and I, again, I think when brands really succeed, they transcend you know, where they came from, the people they came from, the place they came from. They just become kind of bigger than life. Voila, la différence. <laughs> OK. Um, I had one here which is called something that you put in my mind, respecting the myth. And, and it has to do with how much we talk about that we don't really taste. Um, and and this, what comes to mind to me is I, I make some wines in Washington State or have, I'm associated with wines, whatever, and they are fabulous wines. And the dirt there costs $30,000 an acre. And I compare them to wines which I make in Napa, just as good, 
$350,000 an acre. Myth. Okay, Napa is a myth. And as you said before, we talk about Cabernet and how terrible Merlot and the death of Merlot when this silly sideways movie came. <laughs> Pinot, you know, you know, talking about trendy business. The Pinot Noir goes up. Nobody ever cared for it until that movie. And Merlot, which is a wonderful wine, you can't tell it from Cabernet, really. A good, a good, a good location, Merlot, died. So myths that we have to uphold. Yeah, um, We depend on them. Yeah, it, it is true. I mean, in the end, I, I agree with the notion that there are certain myths that are, you know, sacrosanct. And, um, you know, a great example is in all of our wines, we're cork finish. Now, I know that screw caps are just as good and I can do it, but I don't feel the need to change that myth, to challenge that myth. People want to drink fancy wines with corks, I'm going to put fancy wines in corks. And when somebody else proves that they can sell fancy wines without corks, then I might try it. But, but I think that there are myths that really help our business. And you know, what people don't understand, I think, is, is you know, that wine changes. And that if you gave 10 different wines to Robert Parker on two different days, they would all be rated differently. You know, that was just that day. And you know, if you drink a bottle of wine with somebody you like, it's going to taste better than if you drink it with somebody you don't like. And, and, and you know, the, the, those things are, are true. And, and I think that you know, my father's point is, is a really good one, which is you know, my instinct is to challenge those myths. You know? And there's a lot of dogma in production and marketing and everything you do. There's all these rules unwritten, none of them which are substantiated, by the way. They're just theories that people have. And if you're going to plant a vineyard, you're going to have 10 people giving you 10 different ideas of how to plant it. And they're all super smart. And how you make up your mind is it's just really hard, because there's no science, really. There's not. You know, it all changes, right? Because soil and everything. But if you start to destroy all the myths, if you lose all the glamour, if you lose all of that je ne sais quoi, the wine business crumbles, right? Because all of a sudden you lose Napa, you lose Burgundy, you lose Bordeaux. So it's really important, and I think this is something that, that we try to do um, at HV, is kind of walk that fine line between embracing the myths that really matter in the fine wine business and challenging the ones that aren't necessary. Um, and, and it's a fine line. It's a really fine line. And I think ultimately it's what distinguishes the companies that are really, really good at the fine wine business and the ones that maybe aren't. And the, in the future, to, to, to make it work, you're going to have to do it, right? Because you know, if you think about Napa, you know, an average ton of Napa this year, $7,000 a ton. You cannot make a Napa Valley Cabernet for less than $50 retail anymore. You just cannot. And that's a high price for a bottle of wine. So we're going to have to change consumers' perception. We're going to have to teach them that Sonoma's good and that Paso Robles is good and that other places are good. But you have to do it respecting the, the I guess, foundations, the, the, the foundational myths of, of the wine business. And so it's a fine balance, what you challenge, what you take on. All right, let's finish. Yeah, so we're going to finish now. But the thing about finishing is future. And, and I think that we agree that the future really has enormous changes in spite of how old the industry is. We are confronting a real revolution because, first of all, ratings are going to lessen their grip on style and quality. And we're going to be able to do a lot more different qualities and things. I think that packaging is going to change the way we keep wine and do we keep it and when do we drink it, etc. cetera. Um, there are many, many varietals are going to change. I think that we will discover the American varietals. And here we disagree, by the way. And like every other appellation in the world, they have developed through centuries varietals. They may be related to each other, but they have evolved differently in Bordeaux than they have in, let's say, Tuscany. And I think that in California, we are dealing with those varietals and those clones which come from there. And we have a problem because we have much more sun than they do. So we get much more alcohol. So our wines turn out to be more alcoholic. I think that's going to change. So that is the challenge of the University of California, Davis. <laughs> So the transition, it used to be that Augustine Francisco would introduce me 
this, and this is my father, the real Augustine. And now I say, this is my son, the real Augustine. Thank you very much. <laughs> your patience. OK. I don't know if there's any questions or remarks. I think we should do it because out there, right? Uh, one or two questions in here. I think it's done. <laughs> He's bossy, you know. Yeah? Andy. Oh. I really enjoyed your presentation, and I'm very interested about the future. When I think of the future, I always look at what my son is doing. My son is 28. Works in the restaurant business in Washington D.C., which is a pretty hot market. Yeah. And he sent me, of course, on my phone, a picture of a strange bottle of wine, a bottle of Madeira, uh, a Magnum from, you know, some vintage date. And so I asked back, like, what, where did you, where did you get this? And it was a, from a restaurant called Tales of the Goat. And so this is obviously a very trendy restaurant. <laughs> And I look at their wine list, and I don't recognize anything. Right. And I'm a wine professor. Right. <laughs> Imagine if they were all listed by appellations. There's, there's two from Greece, and there's you know some from Spain, from some other islands, et cetera, et cetera. So what I see is this movement. If this, I'm, I'm asking is, do you think this is an authentic movement to very specific local products that are unique? And this, in a way, challenges the concept of brands. In other words, what, what this restaurant is doing is what my son is looking for, apparently, are these very unusual products from around the world, in this case, wine. And I'm just wondering, are you thinking, is this a real trend, or is maybe this is just a little flare-up? Well, I, I remember one of my biggest challenges was like when I'd be selling The Prisoner, right? And I'd go to a hip, cool restaurant. Like in Texas, it was no problem, but I'd go to a hip, cool restaurant in San Francisco and try to sell them The Prisoner, and they say, no, we're not putting that on the list. And you know, I, I knew that if they put it on the list, it would be the number one best-selling wine on that list. And I could even bet the guy. I said, look, try it on for a week. And I bet you we will outsell every other wine, right? And so it's really tough for me. And, and, and I'll say it to you in, in a different context, which, which I think is, is an interesting challenge for all of us, which is look at the number of California wines on all the hip, cool restaurants in New York and San Francisco. And so we're up against a really tough tide there, because all of the other countries in France, they support their wines. In Italy, they support the wines. And all of the cool psalms are not supporting Napa or Sonoma. That, to me, is a big challenge. Um, but what I, you know, I, I think that that's happening. I think that that's a trend. But what you got to remember is, what I, what I always say to myself is that that's not the whole US, right? That when you really, you know, the future of the wine business isn't San Francisco and New York and Washington, DC. It's Texas and Oklahoma and all the other states that are coming and people are starting to grab the wine. So those people are not at you know, your son's level. They probably bought it from Bartholomew Broadbent, by the way, in <laughs> DC. Um, so, so I'm more concerned about that other challenge. But, but I do think there's this huge thing. I have a friend who runs Blue Bottle Coffee. And they now have like 10 stores. And he went to this restaurant to sell Blue Bottle Coffee. And they said, no, you're a chain. So they treat Blue Bottle exactly as they do Starbucks, right? And, and I said, oh my god, you have exactly the same problem that I do. Like, I, I didn't think anybody else had this problem. But, but I think that that is absolutely a trend, and that, that is something that really concerns me. You're absolutely right. Joel, uh-oh. <laughs> And it's really interesting to watch them together. Uh, I've seen them together before. They behave just like this in their normal you know, day to day routine. Um, but Augustine Francisco has always had this kind of energy and this kind of interesting way of looking at the world and trying things on and changing them and moving. So if anybody's been a mover in this business, it's certainly been you. But it's always it's interesting to me that ultimately you've stuck with the major varieties. So you've been in a certain category, Cabernet and Chardonnay. You, you, you risk it on Zinfandel at one point. Um, but, um, but the thing is that you have never 
approach, you talk about changing packaging. We've been talking about changing packaging in this business for 30 years, maybe more. You have corks, oils, you know, screw caps, pack, little packages, big packages. It hasn't happened. It hasn't. And it's not going to happen. <laughs> you don't think so? Uh, I, I honestly don't think it's going to happen because we have, it's one of those, one of those sacred myths. Great wine that comes in bottles and has quotes. And if you're making a less than great wine, you want to imitate that wine. So you're not going to put it in a cardboard box. Imitate a great wine, just like yourself, at the price of the salt. That's right. Anyway, that's my my only beef with what you've said is the packaging. Packaging. You guys are spot on. Thank you. Okay.